contexts um, as well. Um, I will be giving the floor to the presenters very quickly, just for the audience. Um, please, if you have comments and questions, place them into the chat and when we open the floor for questions and I'll relay them to the respective panelists. Um, for now, I would like to um, open the floor for the first presentation, which will explore the impact of war on pervasive nature of organized crime and corruption in Ukraine, as well as different institutional ways of tackling these issues. Um, as presenters, we have Anna Markovska, Associate Professor of Criminology at the Anglica Ruskin University, specialized in organized crime. We have Alexei Serduk, Head of Re the Research Laboratory for Psychological Support of Law Enforcement at Kharkiv National University of Internal Affairs and um, is in Ukraine is Lieutenant Colonel of the Police. And also Irina Solvatenko, Head of Department of Applied Sociology and Social Communications at Kazarin Kharkiv National University. Um, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Anna Markovska and with me presenting is Alexei Serduk and Irina. Um, I'll uh, look uh, after the presentation and then if there are questions, Ale Alexei or Irina uh, will join me to discuss any, any questions you have. So today uh, we would like to share our uh, views or our sort of thoughts around the issues of corruption and corruption control with regards to Ukraine, the country we are from. And um, we'd like to do that in a very difficult context. Um, if you think about it, corruption is always a fight, right? And fighting corruption during the fight, during the war is, um, is extremely difficult. And we would like to perhaps discuss this um, um, we would like to emphasize these difficulties uh, that Ukraine is currently experiencing. So what uh, we want to discuss is why Ukraine, why specifically Ukraine, and why does it matter for Ukraine? Um, we want to touch a little bit on the war propaganda and corruption control. Uh, we uh, show you the results of the studies around trust and uh, an interesting dynamics with the trust during the war that actually reflects on at least people's perception around the fight. What do we know? Uh, about corruption, uh, control from official statistics, and what do we really need to know? Uh, we want to discuss this uh, power to control and the realities of anti-corruption reforms in wider context. Um, uh, the previous uh, on, the, on, on my previous slide, you've seen the um, image of this from the street artist uh, that was um, an image uh, from Los Angeles, and. Um, Interestingly, although first discovered in March 2022, it sort of resonates, I suppose, with many Ukrainians, dress me up for a battle. Um, and it could be read in many different ways, especially to do with uh, corruption and protecting the um, protecting the population. Here is the image, uh, um, another um, poster drawn by Kirilla Bandarenka, again, uh, looking at the sort of classical Ukrainian figures and adapting them to fight with the uh, corruption. So why, why corruption and uh, why do we need to, why do we need to, uh, to fight with, uh, why do we need to discuss Ukraine? Well, first of all, because the, the scale of the uh, problem and the, uh, the number of assets, let's say this way, acquired by elite police from elite, elite uh, politicians from 1991 using criminal means is quite extraordinary. And you probably have seen it in the news and there are numerous investigations in the uh, corruption by an um, uh, elite of the Yanukovych regime and his close circles and the number uh, of the confiscation orders run in millions and billions. Secondly, um, the politics of corruption fight during the Russian war against Ukraine. And um, we would like to touch really briefly on the issue of politicization of, uh, of the fight and perhaps the, the weaponization of the trust. Um, we um, touch really briefly on the strategy to remove all Russian businesses and Russian ties to businesses from Ukraine, rightly so during the war. But we also quite like to maybe um, ask some of, some of the uncomfortable questions of the potential harm um, of these actions, but but that's 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 for um, later. Then we want to touch again really briefly on um, how how do we know uh, what is what is a success with the fight, right? Of 
corruption. Um, we have incredible volume of work versus capacity of the system on the ground, as well as continuous reforms. Um, so there are, we want to position our discussion in, in all these um, sort of three um, dimensions. I want to first start with trust and the issue of trust. And the interesting point is that for a number of years, and I suppose Ukraine here is not very different from any other countries in the world, but the trust of Ukrainian uh, citizens to, uh, to authorities, to the government, to the president, uh, was traditionally extremely low. And you could see here uh, the data from 2020, just before the war, and the, uh, the trust to the um, from national police to you, president of Ukraine is uh, very low. Uh, now the situation has changed dramatically, and in the in the situation of I suppose extreme danger and uh, almost like existential fight, uh, the um, trust and what uh, many sociological surveys um, record is almost a uh, um, 100% trust to the authorities specifically since the beginning of the war the green light is uh, the green line is the trust to the president of ukraine and you could see this uh, this moment when the war started how trust uh, went up and i suppose isn't it we understand why this happens that in a, in, in a situation of crisis people need to um, to find this uh, support and they need to trust the government but also the wartime conditions i suppose allows the state to temporarily use this asymmetric um, interaction mode and to dictate a certain uh, uh, to dictate certain policies and um, the power of these policies is uh, really interesting to us and the power of the policies is uh, has, would have a long term effect obviously um now uh, when we talk about fight and when we talk about corruption fight um and many uh, reporters many investigative journalists or representatives of uh, um Officialdom, they, they argue that, well, people will believe in the decrease of corruption only if they see corrupt state officials in prisons. And uh, there was this famous saying that if politicians say that it's important to stop giving bribes, do not believe them. So um, many also argue that in Ukraine, the problem to fight corruption is not necessarily a problem of the lack of legislation, a problem of structure, but it's a problem of people who are obliged by law to control the situation and follow the rule of law, but for some reasons, be it political, be it uh, other reasons, are not able uh, to do this. And it's interesting again for us to sort of to go a little bit further and to, to, to see where we are. Now, this is the results of the study uh, I'm not sure if you could uh, see that. Yeah, this is the result of the study um, that uh, actually Alexis University has been conducting from 2013. Um, this is part of the um, security and trust survey. And what we measure uh, here uh, is the people's people experience of corruption in the in the Kharkiv region, in the eastern region of Ukraine. And year after year, you see uh, we notice that. Um, at least the behavior of uh, given bribes, uh, voluntary bribes, is going down. We could see that the the only um, the only sort of uh, 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 sort of behavior that is still quite prevalent is using connections, right? Um, so it's interesting to see how uh, corruption control and how uh, policies to uh, enforce corruption control influence, I suppose, what happens on the ground and what happens with real, <laughs> with ordinary people on the ground. And what uh, different uh, surveys, including uh, this one that is presented here, notice is that generally speaking, the um, ordinary citizens have changed their attitude to uh, corruption. They have changed the attitude in, in a way, in a positive way to, for example, to uh, to record, to proceed with the, uh, to use the official routes to fight corruption and not to be a sort of quiet about corruption. Um, what is interesting to us, and um, and this is a subject for potentially for further investigation. So there are two articles, um, article uh, three six eight acceptance of a bribe, and the next slide uh, will be um, 
uh, will show the offering or giving a bribe. It's interesting how um, um, Ukrainian statistics separate this, um, these two uh, uh, behaviors. And what is interesting to us here, you could see very clearly that the numbers of um, acceptance of a bribe, for example, where, while we can discuss why the numbers are going down, but we could also see that there is a significant gap between the criminal offenses that are registered and then um, and the way how they sort of, I suppose, the, the way how they travel through the criminal justice agencies uh, is a very in, uh, a different, di different question. It's a question that requires um, very specific methodology to study, but nevertheless, we're interested in why um, the, the blue lines are the lines what, you, what we see in the news, are the lines that is sort of quite wildly reported. Um, and then uh, we have such a massive drop in the, in the number of cases. Um, a very interesting, uh, and again, something for, for discussion and something for discussion, why, why is this happening? The offering or giving a bribe, there are many more cases currently uh, recorded uh, of the of the offer of the bribe. But again, and, and here we see perhaps more emphasis and more emphasis from the point of view of the, um, of the police on tackling these issues. So um, if we have time, we could touch on this uh, perhaps uh, during the question times, why is it so and um, what matters here in, in regard to these two, um, to these two articles. Um, if we discuss the anti-corruption infrastructure in Ukraine, uh, this is a chart from Transparency International. You could see that Ukraine has a very uh, developed infrastructure and Ukraine developed this infrastructure really quickly. It wasn't an evolutionary development, let's say it was rather a revolutionary development. Most of these agencies appeared um, on the books and started working post 2014. And um, again, when we start um, discussing and uh, very often when we criticize the work of particular agency, we need to take into account that these are um, very um, young agencies, let's say, and the, the powers that are given to them are uh, very often vast, as we discuss on the example of the National Agency ARMA and um, the, uh, the opportunities for abuse and the opportunities for misconduct within the agencies is also quite substantial. And it also is the question that while we creating uh, quite an extensive uh, anti-corruption infrastructure on one side, we're also creating uh, an indirect, I suppose, an, uh, ways how uh, different uh, be it politicians or business figures can interact with this infrastructure. Um, what uh, caught recently the attention of the media, including the international media, is the activities of the ARMA. Uh, this is a national agency uh, that is presented here on, on your screen. It's in the right um, uh, corner. Uh, national Agency for Finding, Tracing, and Management of Assets Obtained Through Corruption and Other Crimes. And um, ARMA has been criticized um, for extremely sort of uh, slow pace of, uh, of reforms and not taking the all the opportunities, I suppose, to um, to deal with and to effectively manage the assets. And uh, many, um, especially investigative journalists, criticized ARMA for not producing uh, um, much more, say, profit to uh, the state uh, into the state budget. For example, in 2022, ARMA spent. Um, significantly more, as you see on the screen, that, than earn. And uh, on Arma's books, and again, this is something that um, takes us to our first point, why is it important to discuss Ukraine and have a look how Ukraine deals with corruption and corrupt assets, is that the assets that are uh, in confiscation order, right, the, the, the thousands of confiscate, uh, confiscated assets that should be managed effectively by Arma um, are quite vast, and the portfolio include uh, petrol stations, uh, um, rail, um, 
a rail system, uh, various uh, uh, factories. So it's a really diverse portfolio that uh, uh, to manage effectively is actually, some may argue quite difficult. However, some argue actually, if you don't manage it well, it also signs of uh, corrupt involvement and corrupt engagement from inside the agency. Um, and here, uh, since the war started, there is a huge emphasis on removing Russian interest and in Russian businesses from Ukraine. Um, and the uh, um, big criticism of Arma was um, something to do with the uh, Russian oligarchs and his um, uh, company that is still operational in Ukraine and the security services of uh, security services of Ukraine uh, published a transcript recently, a conversation between this particular sanctioned individual and um, his business manager in Ukraine discussing the best way how to move funds and discussing very openly how to move funds so that them, these people who are coming after you would not be able to find it. So again, um, it's, a very, it's a very rather complex fight. Another complexity is, is um, to do with sanctions. And um, yesterday there was a, a really brilliant session uh, uh, around the sanctions and uh, Iran and Russia and sanctions again in, Iran in Russia. And somebody used this analogy how very often sanctions are overused. And if sanctions are used as uh, antibiotics very frequently, they may lose this um, effect and become a, a sort of poison in itself. So uh, a very interesting example uh, that we find in the media uh, around uh, um, the companies that are sanctioned uh, in Ukraine uh, is um, um, the company called Freedom House. Um, Again, very interestingly, if you uh, search uh, for information and many investigative uh, journalists, including the ones from Forbes early on in 2021, um, question the successes of the Freedom Holdings and uh, actually almost accuse the company of uh, uh, misleading practices. Now, but it wasn't the, uh, the fraud, the misleading practices that has a potential to bring the company down. It's the sanctions and um, the decision to sanction the freedom finance of Ukraine. Um, those who criticize the decision to sanction argue that uh, look at the number of investors and look at the number of investors, including those who wanted to support Ukrainian war efforts and who, who had purchased the war bonds issued by Ukrainian Ministry of Finance through the company. So what does it mean, right? Does it mean that uh, how do we read the sanctions and reading between the line of the sanctions is also quite important. And it's a very uncomfortable question, but that's uh, it's some of the questions that we perhaps want to ask, uh, as well as um, uh, very often when we look around the issue of sanctions, it's a certain, isn't it, militarization of the fight against uh, corruption, which is, we may argue rightly so, given the, the time and given the task that uh, is in front of Ukraine. Um, now, uh, when we talk about the open data about corruption, uh, of the fight uh, uh, with corruption, we talk about the many sides and Ukraine is probably one of those countries who moved really quickly into this uh, e-data and you could find uh, even if you can't find the data around the activities of certain um, state organizations, you could find some indirect data about the activity on many, um, on many sites. Um, the examples are here. And the, the last one, uh, the Prezora site, is a brilliant site to, to look at the ways how the tenders are working or not in, in the country. I'm you could sorry, also, you have roughly two more minutes. Okay, thank you. You could also search the most uh, uh, corrupt uh, region uh, according to the particular month, um, and you could look at uh, many different ways of uh, engaging with the issue of corruption. So, uh, Klitgard um, argues that. Um, we need to, uh, isn't it? We need to see the fried fish. We need to see those uh, elite uh, politicians or elite businessmen going to prison. The way how they go to prison is also important. Recently, uh, President Zelensky argued that elite corruption should be considered in the same way as collaboration with the enemy. And he argued that uh, it's important to equate corruption with high treason in wartime. 
really tricky we um, think uh, um, statement and the statement again that um, uh, may need to be discussed and there are quite a lot of uh, negative uh, um, I suppose effects that this could um, lead to so what just my few concluding thoughts uh, revolutionary actions versus moral evolution um, is important it's important for society to to reach this state to um, to fight corruption and we could argue here that actually the ordinary citizens of Ukraine are more more likely to fight with corruption than the state officials um, moral evolution the issue of shame and guilt they're not ashamed to be shamed very often you find lots of uh, uh, discussion in the media in Ukraine around corrupt schemes and yet uh, we see two or three months later corrupt officials back in, in their seats. And also the issue that uh, we do want to maybe discuss later on uh, is the politicization of fight against corruption, especially specifically during uh, wartime. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for that presentation. Um, I'd like to remind all the um, audience members to already um, start placing their questions and comments in the chat so that we can move through them um, at the end of all the presentations. Um, but then um, I would like to give the word to uh, Francesca Rispoli, a postdoc research fellow in political science at the University of Pisa, um, who has researched um, perceptions of an activist, activism from below in response to mafias and corruption on a national, international basis. So Francesca, the word is yours. Hi, can you see my screen? Everything is okay? Yes, we can see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. I'm uh, glad to share with you a study uh, on uh, civic monitoring initiatives that are started in uh, Italy uh, following to the pandemic and after the launch of the Next Generation AU Plan. Uh, so this is uh, an, exploratory, an exploratory study, and the aim is to reflect on how monitoring can be a tool for preventing and fighting corruption, uh, considering its uh, potential for civic engagement. So today I present a research plan. Uh, this is uh, just the first step of uh, uh, of this plan. At the moment, I prepare uh, a first review that is focused uh, on desk research. But uh, now I'm collecting more data to analyze uh, the mechanism and uh, the actors and the dynamics that are among, among them. Here you can see the main topic of this uh, presentation and uh, the main element uh, about this step of research. Uh, so, first of all, the definition of corruption, uh, here we assume the one uh, proposed by Transparency International, so uh, the most widely used, uh, the abuse of uh, entrusted power for uh, private gain, uh, that is also adopted by many public and private uh, institutions. In contrast, uh, anti-corruption could be described as a framework that includes all uh, institutions and uh, also civil rules, practices, and actions, so also uh, civic monitoring. Nowadays, uh, many scholars describe corruption as a systemic phenomenon that could influence uh, various sectors. And so to analyze the social relationships and dynamics that can influence systemic cor corruption, uh, a fundamental factor is uh, uh, social capital. Uh, here we talk about social capital, uh, how we can discover network relationship and social interaction that uh, uh, individual and groups have within a society uh, or uh, in a community. But uh, social capital uh, is a tricky concept because uh, uh, we can see how it can promote illegal networks network as corruption or organized crime. And in this case, uh, the social capital is a tool that uh, consent the relationship among uh, entities that run exclusively private and illegal scope. But at the same time, studies indicate that communities uh, with uh, uh, rich social capital focused on the common good are stronger against uh, the corruption. So uh, the point is uh, uh, how and for what the social capital is used uh, for positive or negative uh, uh, network. 
But uh, the creation of social capital also depends on the institution's ability to be close to the citizens and uh, to, generate, to generate trust in them. So trust is a focal point. Uh, here we can see some data about uh, Eurobarometer surveys. Uh, and uh, we can see that 74 of uh, respondents believe that corruption is widespread in the national institutions of their uh, country, and a similar 73 believing uh, in the presence of corruption at the local level. So uh, this lack of trust starts a, a vicious cycle among the citizens, institutions, and economic operators. And uh, in the, the risk is to tolerate the ir irregular practices as normal. In fact, uh, the feeling is pessimistic about the national efforts uh, to combat and fight uh, corruption. So starting with this uh, consideration is essential uh, to promote a policy addressed to civic engagement. First of all, the transparency could encourage the monitoring and the accountability of institution. Uh, in fact, the relationship between uh, elected the representative and the elector were transformed, we can see it also uh, about the abstentionism. And in this transformation, we can see a different and growing involvement of other actors, uh, both from the public and the private sectors uh, in shaping economy and the social governance. Uh, so there are more and more uh, possibilities of judgment by citizens. And in this new context, uh, we have a different relationship with institutions also related to the globalization, uh, because we can see that in the last three decades, associations and the NGOs, uh, the so-called civil society plays an important role as a, a critical component, also asking for accountability of politics. And so the citizen direction is a part of this new rela relationship and this new dynamic. But what about civic engagement? Uh, civic engagement uh, refers to the involvement of citizens to bridge individual life with collective life uh, through a political process, a participation process. Among these, the practices of uh, civic engagement, there are some specifically uh, aimed uh, at monitoring the action of public administration. Uh, considering the good governance can be a useful tool against forms of corruption. And so civic monitoring is one of these practices. It is a practice that is also uh, start with the technological innovation uh, that had a, a direct impact on citizenship and on political participation. Uh, the evolution of, of modern democracies uh, uh, leads to a model of uh, the so-called uh, continuous democracy or hybrid democracy. Uh, so the nature of participation is becoming more hybrid uh, because it, it extends uh, across multiple uh, levels, embracing uh, a multi-membership in social and the cultural context. Uh, also um, online and offline, bringing it together online and offline uh, dimension. Uh, among the proactive practices developed in recent years, uh, we can see civic monitoring as a, a grassroots participation tool that uh, responds to the widespread climate of uh, uh, democratic distrust that we already see. Uh, and so one of the main author that uh, uh, studied these practices is uh, Michael Schatzon that uh, talk about the monitoring of citizens uh, as a person who can analyze the context in which live uh, and uh, is ready to become active when the, uh, its intervention can be relevant. So a monitoring uh, a monitorial citizen is one that is interested in politics, that believe that his action can have an impact and so can be relevant, uh, is a person that is politically active, but not necessarily co connect with the uh, conventional organization as such uh, uh, politics or other institution or other association. Uh, 
also John Keane talk about the uh, monetary democracy, but for Keane, the decline in uh, democratic participation can be uh, reserved only through a systemic change in which the engagement and the accountability have a preeminent role. So in this context, the power abuses and the illegal practices uh, can be more widely identified and reported. And so in order to alert or advise who manage the institution. So Shatson and Keen studied this kind of new uh, citizen. And now we uh, arrive in the Italian context, that is my specific case. In Italy, we have uh, now we have three laws that provide tools to citizens to scrutinize the public administration. We have the FOIA, that is a specific law on access to administrative information to formal request. Uh, but we also have the law 119 uh, that focuses uh, on the proactive publication of information through website by institutions. And we also have uh, uh, the simple uh, civic access that is a mechanism for obtaining uh, information openly without a formal request. But uh, these laws are recent, less than 10 years. So now is necessary a long uh, civic and cultural journey to promote these possibilities uh, of data, uh, of data access for everyone. Uh, we can say that this is an ongoing process. And uh, uh, a big occasion is uh, gave by uh, the Recovery and Resilience Facility Fund that is a strategic initiative adopted uh, by many countries uh, after pandemic. Uh, and uh, in the plain, the accountability is previewed and promoted because uh, uh, there is written that uh, uh, the collection of data for monitoring of the implementation of the plan is uh, a very main topic. But uh, despite these uh, important words and official words, uh, now we don't have any uh, update and official uh, platform with data in Italy, with data about the Resilience Fund. And so uh, in this context, uh, some civic and uh, independent entities are monitoring and asking for transparency. And I presented my first qualitative map uh, among six uh, uh, representative experiences that uh, address the monitoring of the, of the fund. Uh, here we can see we have uh, two initiatives that, initiative that are based on data. Uh, providing data as uh, open police, uh, that is uh, civic tech, or uh, asking data as uh, Dati Bene Comune, that is a uh, campaign. Uh, the uh, other initiatives are more uh, community-based and try to engage citizens in the monetary action uh, as uh, Libenter and the common community monitoring. And we also have two observatories. Uh, one is a civic experience that also carry out training with communities, uh, the civic observatory. And uh, the other one is uh, promoted by a university and is uh, addressed to specific and economic stakeholder, uh, the Observatory of Recovery Fund. Uh, these experience have uh, different methods and network, and uh, we can see a lot of uh, connection among, uh, among them. Uh, so there is a contamination and uh, uh, cooperation. And this is, I, I say, this is a good result. Also considering that there, are, uh, there is a, lot, a lack of data from uh, official pl platform. Uh, all of them ask for transparency. Uh, and most of them are focused on civic engagement. So, uh, to, to conclude, this, the, the Resilient Fund is a, a unique opportunity for economic and social recovery, recovery after the pandemic. This is uh, a point. Uh, but despite this, uh, in the Italian context, uh, the citizen seems to be poorly informed about uh, the development of the, uh, of the plan and uh, not at all involved in uh, programmatic action. Uh, in spite of what there is written in the 
plan. Some uh, uh, European uh, regulation, the Italian laws, would allow access to the information, but uh, uh, on one side, there is uh, a lack of um, institutional platform with update and complete data. And on the other side, uh, some of CIC uh, initiatives for monitoring the plan have emerged over the past uh, two years, more or less, uh, with different and uh, complementary characteristics. So we have some uh, open question um, in which way these activities are engaging uh, citizens, uh, with, with kind, which kind of uh, activities they carry, out or carry on, uh, which of these activities can be labeled as civic monitoring, civic monitoring experiences. Uh, this is the one of the points of my research plan. Uh, it, at this first step of research, I didn't find uh, any contact between uh, this initiative and the government. Uh, so at this stage, we can say that there is no dialogue uh, between or involvement between this initiative and uh, the, the current government, but uh, neither with the others uh, before government. Uh, so this is a, your opportunity to promote accountability. The Resilience Fund is uh, an opportunity to promote uh, transparency, uh, also to engage uh, the citizens but nowadays we can see that there is a, a lack of transparency. Uh, and so uh, this is a, just the first, the, an early stage uh, research plan. Uh, but uh, starting from this review, uh, I can reach with other data that I'm collecting. The, uh, and uh, I also uh, wait for your comment to improve my, my research. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Francesca, for your presentation. Um, I've started to see that there's um, some questions coming in the chat. Um, and please pose them uh, as the presentations continue, because we will open uh, the floor after all the presentations have um, uh, been concluded um, in the discussion Q&A section. And I'll direct them to the respective um, uh, panelists. Um, but for now, I would like to give the word over um, for the final presentation, which will be examining the drivers of corruption in the Kruger National Park um, in South Africa. Uh, so we're joined by Alistair Nelson. Uh, he's Managing Director of Conservative Synergies, um, an organization that supports governments and their partners across Southern and Eastern Africa to look at conservation problems from new angles. Um, so over 30 years of experience in this field um, and also managing projects, countering wildlife trafficking, and also worked as a former analyst for Global Initiative. Um, so Alistair, thank you so much. Um, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, and I guess to start by saying that this is not working in, um, in uh, in corruption and anti-corruption is not my um, not my area of expertise. I'm a conservationist, and this is actually at a different level as well. So coming down to an area where we um, came across major corruption issues, which were having conservation impact, and some of the techniques we've tried to use to address those, basically. Uh, so I look forward to uh, critical any critical questions. So what we what I'm going to present on is some research we did to understand the drivers of corruption. So Let's take a step back. What we found was high levels of corruption amongst field rangers in particular on the ground in Kruger National Park associated with a high value product, rhino horn, and the poaching of rhino horn and the organized criminal networks penetrating the field rangers um, once law enforcement had become good enough to meet them in the field um, and to disrupt their organized crime activities. They turned to penetrating the, um, the field rangers groups and and then getting information that way. And so what we did was to try and understand how that was happening, the drivers of it, and what we could do to address it. So I'm going to present on the research and a little bit on the plan that we've had underway and we've been implementing since January this year to try and address some of this these corruption activities. And this is work that was done by myself, along with Kathy Dreyer, who's the head ranger of Kruger National Park, and Joe Shore of, of WWF, and was all funded by USAID. Okay. Um, 
So the key thing about our work was it explicitly was not an investigation, but we were trying to understand the dynamics and the evidence using evidence-based approaches as well to develop a plan to mitigate and build resilience to the corruption we were seeing. We started with a literature review and used an expert panel as well so that we could look at how these issues had been addressed elsewhere in, in different places. And we had a panel that had people say from Mexico, Uganda, um, uh, Norway with U4, um, and looking at um, issues to do with gender and corruption, behavior change and corruption. So we tried to get as broad as possible because clearly this wasn't an area that we had expertise in. We then did interviews with managers and field rangers to understand the local context and the dynamics. We co-developed an implementation plan, which is what we're implementing now. And I'll go through this these interview section. Again, as the definition, we used a very similar one. We used the same one as what Francesca used, the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. We focused on petty corruption, not the higher level corruption um, that is happening at a political level where these the organized crime groups are able to get political protection and traffic the goods out of South Africa. We were focused very much on the groups in uh, on the ground the, this, um, in um, Kruger National Park, which is huge. It's, it's the size of the state of Israel um, and the provinces around it um, and understanding what was happening at that ground level. Our, an assumption, our, our awareness, of course, that organized crime cannot exist without corruption, but also we came at it with the approach that if we focus on the individual alone, on the bad apple, that leads us to technical responses which emphasize control and oversight. And we know from behavioral science that people respond better in the workplace when they are managed to have a, a purpose, a sense of purpose, mastery and autonomy. You know, Dan Pink's work on, on this and the research that's been done on what motivates people to, to in the workplace. So we, we didn't want to focus, we didn't want a solution that focuses on technical responses with control and oversight. We were clear that we needed to understand the societal pressures as well and the social norms that shape these behaviors that we want to change. And we need to target our responses to mitigate those, recognizing the role of the organization. So from our background work, we kind of came up with uh, what we saw in the area and what speaking to experts and literature, we really, there were five responses that we could take to, to address this issue. So investigating and prosecuting corruption, obviously, um, target investigations, there must be consequences, but we'd also know from behavioral science that for a criminal justice system to work and to change people's behavior, it needs to be swift, fair, and certain. And in the countries we're talking about, South Africa and Mozambique, our criminal justice system is anything but swift, fair, and certain. So we can't rely on, on this, uh, this approach alone. The other approach and second approach is really to looking at how we expose it, increasing transparency and accountability. So there's been um, an openness now we've been working on to investigative journalism coming in to understand it, um, to having improved communication within the organization. The third approach is, is strengthening organizational strengthening. And you and ODC have a great framework for this with wildlife crime. But this is really the, that risk-based approach where you look for the vulnerabilities and you have specific targeted actions to address these. This is really strengthening systems and processes. And while this is important and we need to do it, we wanted to make sure that we didn't entirely focus on this for exactly the reasons I said at the beginning. Next, we need to look at organizational culture and the, and the value of integrity. Um, and here, um, where people work is often cultivating those in individual and organizational ethics and values that are more resilient to corruption. Leadership styles based on shared values and a working mode environment that emphasizes intrinsic motivation based on purpose, principles, and values, and how we can use screening processes, especially during selection and promotion to, to make sure that we employ the right people and then, and then promote the right people easy to write and say, much harder in practice. And as we, if anyone's following what's been going on with the Australian Defence Force as well, learning um, that in, in that instance, so, so those are rights abuses, um, but but changing organisational culture is very hard if, unless you understand the power dynamics that operate within it. So there, there was attempts to change organisational culture at a senior leadership level, but the power dynamics within the Australian Special Forces really focus around the patrol leader. And if you don't understand that, it's very hard to change the dynamics of what's happening on the ground. And, and this is something we've been taking to heart. The fifth approach is a focus on the individual. So using behavioral sciences as well. So understanding the social norms associated with corruptions, the function that corruption may fulfill, taking specific targeted actions, shortening the distance between the corrupt act and the societal consequence, because it's often seen as a victimless crime. And then thinking about how we can have free, frequent touch points as well, knowing how we as humans act, um, 
don't act so so logically um, that we, we short term actions play are, are um, play much more of a role in how we decide to do things. So we needed to have more frequent touch points, both. Um, supportive, but also the the negative ones as well, and change that perceptions of organizational values as well as the perceptions of the risk associated with a bad behavior or co a corrupt behavior. Um, so a key model that we've used to think about our work is the social ecological model. So here we're thinking about the complex interplay between the individual, the relationships that individuals have, the community that we sit within, and then the whole of society. And we th we've thought of this as, as a need to understand the range of factors that put people at risk, um, at risk of making a bad behavior, at risk of sometimes the violence that's threatened to them for making that behavior, um, so be that corruption or violence. And for us, we've thought about it as, um, for you know, we're specifically focused on field rangers, we've thought about it at the individual level. What are the individual motivations? What are their feelings? What are the values that they bring to the job? What are the qualities that they bring? Um, as well as individuals, and how can we then link that to their sense of autonomy, mastery, and purpose in their job, knowing that that's what motivates people to, to perform well at work. The relationship that they have, and here as the individuals, as field rangers, we focused on their teams. They operate in small groups of, of um, anywhere between 14 to 22 people, and that's the focus on those interactions between people and the leadership as well, and how can we bring about a sense of belonging, cohesion, and purpose within those groups. And from a community perspective, we focused on the organization. Here it's Ranger Services, which is 400 staff. And what's the culture of that organization, the values that it has, the structures that are, and are there rules within it that are operating effectively? And what are the physical and social environments that people live within within that? And again, that's around these, these senses of values. Um, and finally, at a societal level, um, we've had to think about the societal norms that exist within within the, where these people live and the higher level what what's happening with high level governance with the policies and then structural um, issues that are happening so we know that people respond better to when they feel that they live in, in in a well governed fair and equitable space now this is something we can't control obviously the work that we're doing we can try and have an impact on the individual the teams and the and the organization we can't control what's going on at the society level and we know that in south africa and in fact we know globally at the moment we're having really a, pretty much a breakdown in in overall governance and leadership in sense of values as well um, but particularly in these four provinces that we're talking about two in south africa two in mozambique around the Kruger National Park, this is a major, major issue. Um, so when we think about the challenges that these individuals are facing, if we can be addressing at least three of those levels, we always have to be thinking at three of those levels and then thinking about those five approaches and sort of cross-cutting those. So we're really thinking about our solutions. We have to think, how can we use all of those five approaches? How can we make sure we're operating at the three levels that we can influence? Um, and then we're more likely to have a lasting impact on the work that we're trying to do. Okay, so that's, I guess, what this slide is saying. We we're, we're recognize that reducing corruption and building integrity are complex processes, and we're looking at these systemic interventions from drawing from the five approaches targeted at all three of those social levels. Now, there was a big push in, society, in um, this area for polygraph testing as, as the kind of silver bullet, um, and we've really pushed back on that um, and to say that it does have a role to play, obviously, but it must be fair, transparent, and consistent, and it must be seen to reduce the risk to staff as well. And now this has come in from a ministerial level in South Africa. So it's not something that we can resist, but it is something that we can um, tailor to be much more appropriate than the initial overtures that were made. So we did interviews with um, under, we had a research permit from the University of the Vardisrand. We did 27 interviews with management staff in the greater Kruger area. And we ended up with 32 um, interviews, workable interviews with field rangers working. We, we did 36, um, but four staff just wouldn't talk. Now we know from financial investigations that we interviewed people who have unexplained finances in their money in their bank accounts. So we know that we interviewed some people who have been involved in corruption. Um, these were anonymous, but we know, so we, how the data, we used the data anonymously, but we knew some of the people that we interviewed were involved. Um, and so that's, that it helps us to know that we've got a good background um, on the, on, from the interviews. So um, what did we, at, at a, from our interviews, um, what we learned is we broke this up into sort of the regional, the organizational, and the individual level. What we learned is that people told us that social sociocultural norms are changing rapidly in this area. And particularly 
we see the the norms associated with it's it's quite a um uh, this um that's what i'm looking for it's quite a, a, a um a paternal culture um so and what we're seeing is that the, the the means for men to progress and to gain status in the society have changed and and instead of that being now associated with livestock or or other acts um physical acts it's now people are seeking prestige in particular through wealth accumulation and conspicuous consumerism particularly on social media apps and it doesn't matter where you got the wealth from so much because of this breakdown in governance um in in the region um we're seeing weak governance and high levels of criminality and corruption surrounding the actually let's just say kruger national park that's an acronym for a broader area but we're seeing weak governance and high levels of criminality as one of the interviewees said would it's like trying to create an island of lawfulness in a, in a sea of unlawfulness within the national park itself and and the organization um the parastatal organization that, that manages it um let me just um, try and move this out of the way um what we're seeing is a perception that there's corruption in many places in the organization people spoke about um about being you know trying to when you apply for jobs that there's you you have to sometimes pay that there's um building contracts there's corruption associated with it it was, wasn't only associated with um information being given for poaching so there's this been this general breakdown of malaise in the organization as a whole and there's a perception of impunity and lack of consequences for corruption or unprofessional behavior. So there's a perception that leadership has become weaker and that people can get away with being late for work, not delivering properly on their jobs, all kinds of other unprofessional behavior, which allows them to then in get involved in, in poor behavior of which corruption, corrupt acts as one. At an individual level, there was an almost universal perception that there's been a breakdown in trust amongst key staff in Kruger National Park, especially the rangers. And Really, what I haven't mentioned here is that when the rhino poaching really picked up in Kruger National Park, driven by um, criminal activity by people coming in with with weapons, often from Mozambique across the border, because the Kruger National Park is on the border of the two countries, it led to a um, a very militarized response from South Africa to meet these um, the poachers in the field and to train the field rangers to be able to enter into contact with these poachers so to, to try and arrest them but to be very very clear on the use of force and when they could enter into contact with them if weapons were raised and what that led to was a quite militarized response use of helicopters and now tracker dogs and it's been a, a relatively successful response although we've just seen this escalation of of each side um and so the rhino poaching has continued. The amounts of entries to the park have continued despite this escalation in the militarized response. But what the militarized response has led to is a fair amount of trauma amongst the people who are, who are involved in that. So amongst the law enforcers themselves. And that and that trauma, it's, I can't go into it here. Some of that, a lot of that is related to South Africa's apartheid past. Um, how, how that power is being, um, how the, the, um orders and, and the training is happening who's giving the orders who's carrying them out so and who the um who the poachers are so there's still a fair amount of white leadership there's the black field rangers who are who are uh, taking the brunt of the violence or perpetuating the brunt of the violence against other black men who they can often relate to there but for my job go i kind of thing so that shift in focus really um to that militarized response and that had led to it accentuated the power imbalances, accentuated some of the racial problems that still existed, and that led to this breakdown in trust amongst multiple levels within within the park. As one, um, and and with that, information was being withheld from senior levels of management to the field rangers on on what was happening on the ground. As one interviewee said, "If I'm not a worthy employee, let me be a worthy thief." So we asked the interviewees, what would you do if you were in charge for a couple of days? And so these are some of the things that came up. Enforce the consequences for corruption. Enforce the rules, reduce the sense of impunity in general and for unprofessional behavior as well. Improve investigations, make sure there are successful prosecutions and give feedback. Some saw the role for polygraph integrity testing. The field rangers in particular spoke about actively shaping norms and values. One field ranger said, or actually a number of field rangers said, we must remove staff from ranger services who do not show the appropriate values. So one actually said, so a senior field ranger said, that doesn't mean that 
they need to not have their jobs. They can work somewhere else in, in the organization, just not within range of services. We need people with the right values. Better selection of people with the correct values. and want managers to lead by example, to have open dialogue, to rebuild trust and, and re bring back the in-service training. So the in-service training stopped with this heavily militarized response. Focus on leadership, focus the field ranges on purpose and values and general skills training. And as a field ranger said, you build integrity through an ongoing process. You don't just test for it. Um, improve organizational effectiveness. So organizational leadership development processes, improving that transparency and flow of information, improving cohesion, communication, and trust, a working climate where staff feel respected and heard. And this very much gets at the imbalances in power and race. Um, organizational values and professional standards need to be maintained. Um, address the unfairness related to race and power issues. Instill professionalism, integrity, and discipline. Many spoke of trust as an operational requirement for their job, particularly because they're entering into um, sometimes life-threatening, physically threatening um, um, situations in their job. They want leaders to lead by example and managers to be firm and fair. There were concerns around the misuse of the grievance processes as well. I won't go into this, but that's actually I won't go into it at all. We're running short on time. Um, I want to provide staff with support, so particularly around the drivers of corruption. And we've found that um, debt and household debt in particular has become is a major issue for these field rangers. And there's reasons why that's happened, um, particularly post-COVID, but there's a whole lot of reasons. And literally on Monday, we're starting a whole big survey and interview process associated with understanding debt better and how that links then to um, to blacklisting when people can't repay the debt that links then to loan sharks and involvement of loan sharks, which then ties these field ranges into uh, organized crime in another way. Um, we're looking how we can counter the approaches used because the one thing, the one positive thing is that every time one of our field rangers gets hit up to for, to, to, for a corrupt act, that's a ping on our side. That's an intelligence hit. Like, so we can learn from that. We can understand those approaches, um, et cetera. We, I mean, from a law enforcement perspective, one day we could potentially penetrate um, backwards, but that's 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 a way away, I think, in terms of safety and, and, and procedures in this area. We're also looking at mental and physical health as well, particularly as, uh, because of the trauma that I mentioned. Need to address staff grievances and the sense of unfairness, which erode commitment to the job, to reward hard work and integrity, ensure adherence, of course, to policies and regulations and remove incompetent and disrespectful staff. This came from both levels. Field rangers talking about it, their leaders and leaders talking about the field rangers as well. So that's the simple plan that we came up with. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail. Just to say that action one over here, where I, if you can see my mouse, we're focusing there on the organization. How how, and we've gone right back to some of the basics around what we need in people, the values of the organization, what specific attributes we want in people. Um, and we've gone all the way through the organization and they've, at, at a range of services level, they've decided they want people with integrity, accountability, discipline, and courage. And now we're looking at ways that we can actually test for those behaviors during the selection processes. The selection processes are 10 days to two weeks. So we, and they put people under, under, um, physical strain. So we can actually use that process and that to, to, to test for those four attributes that we're looking for. We've done benchmarking um, of pay. We're doing um, redoing the in-service training, specialization, skills development training. We're doing a lot of work on leadership and training and mentoring and having those hard conversations about race and power as well. The next one, we're, we're looking at individual ranges. So we're understanding the approaches better. As I said, we're starting all this debt work um, there was mental health support. We've been extending that and, and helping that, um, improving that. There's legal support as well, which we're looking at. And we're, we're bringing back a lot to do with physical health and so on. The Rangers specifically spoke about how sports disappeared when they entered into this traumatic response. Um, third is the integrity test, the polygraph testing. Um, which we have to, as I mentioned, go in, we have to do. And there's, so we've got a whole system worked around that. It's quite complicated, but we're, um, we're using behavioral science and how we do that. Um, and we're being trying to be very, very clever in that and, and minimize the amount of testing we do, but use the results of the testing to drive um, people to either resign or abscond. So people who have been involved, we're trying to set it up so that they can, they will either leave basically rather than be tested and, and go through a disciplinary process or possibly uh, a criminal action if they find, if, if, because if there's a follow-up investigation finds that they were involved. And then we've been working on strengthening investigations and prosecution as well. So there's a new, luckily, there's a new national strategy in South Africa, and we've been implementing, which 
which is a national strategy looking at integration of how you address counter wildlife trafficking. And we brought that down to a local level and brought together the prosecution's authority, the police, and some of the intelligence agencies to try and target some activity around these corrupt activities so that we can actually have some of the negative consequences as well. And there's been some successful convictions already, um, particularly around using the financial side of these crimes as well, and which has gone into the bank accounts and that's gone into family members of the field rangers. So we've got some strong negative responses. And then the rest is around how we entrench this, the bottom three around how we entrench that. Um, actually, I'm going to, how are we doing on time? Um, uh, just for concluding remarks, I think we have 15 more minutes before the panel ends and for some questions. Okay. So the final concluding remarks I'm going to say, then I'll just take a complete step aside. We've, we've basically taken a completely different approach to, to how we address law enforcement now in Kruger. Um, so this is using Simon Sinek's um, sort of leadership approach of the infinite game. Um, in the past, what we were seeing, the approach that we were using is this kind of war on poaching, this war on corruption was very much using a finite game approach where we were acting like we we knew who the players were, that there were rules that were adhered to, and there would be a defined endpoint when we won this game. So what we're doing now is really taking, and what we swapped to in the middle of this year was an infinite game approach. And, and the whole of Ranger Services have now taken this on board, where we're saying we don't know the players. There are changeable rules. There's no end to this. The objective for us is not to win. The objective of us is to be stay in the game, basically, to have the systems that will keep us in the game. And what do we need for that? What are our strategic approaches? We need a just cause. And so we've gone back to that. What, what, what motivates people to be involved in this organization, to do this work? We've got to be build trusting teams. And there's been a huge focus on that. And we'll be continuing that over the next two years. We've got to respect our rival. Um, we've got to understand how they operate. And that's both the poachers, but also the, the, the groups that are at a higher level that are entering into these corrupt activities that are breaking down governance. Understand them. Give, them the, give it the respect that makes you think, okay, we have to take this on. We need to be flexible and adaptive. And so we're learning as we go. And we need to have the courage to lead. And what does that mean? That means that we need to be vulnerable. We need to have these difficult conversations around race and power and the other challenges that we have at a societal level. Um, Anna spoke about that very early on in her, her presentation as well. There are uncomfortable things that happen and we have to talk about them. But then we also sometimes need to make tough decisions. We need to think outside what we're used to doing and do things differently. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of the to all of the presenters, actually. Um, so I would I would like to well open the floor for questions and discussions. Um, we have uh, one question from the audience right now. Um, and uh, I think this might be uh, important both for Francesca, um, but also Ale uh, Alexei, I think you've uh, taken um, or, or already provided some answer to it. But the question um, would be, um, how or what is the importance of an active citizenship um, in the achievements of public administration accountability? Um, so. Perhaps, can I direct that question first to Francesca? Okay. Uh, uh, so we can we can say in recent decades, uh, we, we have seen a progressive uh, distance between uh, citizens and the institution uh, as abstention is uh, seen in the most uh, major democracies. So, uh, civic engagement, uh, also using uh, new media and uh, technologies uh, could uh, interrupt this uh, distance and uh, uh, generate a new relationship between uh, citizens and the institutions. Uh, a new relationship based on transparency and on accountability. And this could generate uh, a new trust uh, we we have now nowadays we have a lack of trust so uh, this is a focal point uh, to to achieve a new kind of uh, a new relationship between the citizens and the institution that could uh, fight corruption uh, bottom up, uh, through bottom up uh, initiatives mm -hmm. yeah thank you i think uh, in a lot of the presentations that was touched upon um you know trust and also how to kind of build relationships within society. Um, however, I would also like 
perhaps uh, Alexi to um, expand on his answer as well um, in the chat, which I, I believe is a little bit more critical to that uh, perspective. Uh, I believe your mic is Alexi. Yep. I want to add uh, our final conclusion thought. Anna already says they are not ashamed to be ashamed. So public uh, engagement is contracting of corruption process. Um, obviously ends on detecting these cases, cases of bribing. All, uh, but transparency means that transparency must be all process from detecting crime to sentencing. If you remember our presentation, I can remind you, uh, and if you uh, allow me to share again this slide, this blue line, this is, uh, this is what uh, means public engagement, transparency, and other. Public participation ends in detecting crimes. They show it in media, uh, shame all these corruption persons, but this is detected crime. What happens further? No one looks what happens further. Who, um, uh, for example, uh, orange line, this is detected persons, they get suspicions. This is 80 persons uh, left on, only on this stage when persons who participate in this corruption detected. Then green line, this is cases who go to courts. This is 50, <laughs> again, 50% decrease. And then red bar is sentenced persons. So why uh, public not uh, show all this chain? All, all this organization, Transparency International, uh, civic organization, public, media, they show just this blue bar. It's beneficial for them. They also players in this uh, game, <laughs> like Alistair said. They show the words, they get money for this shaming, but corruption is now not shamed to be ashamed. They must be sentenced. Mm. And what's happened between this blue line and red line, uh, as I say, in, uh, during the war, there's thousand cases of corruption of bribing detected and only 65 uh, cases go to the uh, sentence at person's sentences. So, so it is six persons of all cases detected and showed in public or probably in media go to the prison. Mm -hmm. Probably be my answer as police mm -hmm. officer. Yes, thank you. I can see um, that uh, Alistair, uh, would you like to uh, add to that as well? Yes. Um... So learning from so some of the things we've learned in wildlife crime, I mean, we're lucky in wildlife crime in that there's a real interest in the, there's a real interest in the, in the final outcome. What, what, do, what do people want to measure? They want to measure less animals dying, basically. So when people, when we, when the, um, when the monitoring, when people were responding, giving back um, results that are the number of arrests or the number of cases taken to court, there was a desire from the donors to say, okay, but how does that link to the less animals dying? Like, can you show us the chain of causation, basically? So we've been forced to, to deal with exactly what you're pointing out, Alexi. So mm -hmm. we've had to, and, and what that has led to in a number of countries that have been in, in this part of the world, in Southern and East Africa, that where there's been some real success in, in addressing the criminal justice system and how it impacts wildlife crime has been court monitoring processes, basically. Um, and civil society organizations taking on court monitoring, often working very closely with the National Prosecuting Authority, because some of that court monitoring is passive, where maybe there's new legislation comes in, and you can then see if that legislation is being actually used in the court. But also, it's, you can compare how both legislation and decisions are being made around different courts around the country and so on from that monitoring, and then active monitoring as well. So it was a great case in Malawi, where a very high-level trafficker, probably the most high-level trafficker arrested Chinese um, family, um, that were, and the whole of the family members were arrested. They'd been active for 20 plus years, huge levels of corruption across the country that they, that, that corrupt support that and, and mechanisms that they had. And 
And there was some very active intelligence gathering on what was going on during that case. So they knew that they were corrupting officials involved in the case. And what ended up happening, active monitoring, was putting ambassadors in the court during that case so that it became impossible for anything Mm -hmm. untoward to happen. So this link between active and passive monitoring, civil society monitoring, but civil society often connecting into the prosecuting authority to basically say, hey, we're doing stuff, but we're going to share it with you so that it can be useful as well. So I completely, you know, it's one of the things that at least we've been able to learn a little bit from wildlife crime, but which isn't as large as the challenges you're dealing with. Mm. Yes, thank you. Um, actually, we we have five more minutes left until the closing of this uh, panel. Um, but Alistair, I have one more um, question for you um, from the audience. Um, very interesting presentation, um, and um, I wonder if you could say more about how grievance procedures are misused. Yeah, sure. Um, so the easy way is that they're misused by um, the criminal groups. So the criminal groups target the um, using the corrupt rangers, the rangers that they've corrupted, rather. Um, they then target the good rangers with um, grievance procedures, basically, and they tie them up in administration, and they actually tie the whole uh, the whole organization up in administration. Um, so that's the that's the simple answer to that. Um, and what that leads to, I guess, as well, is then because there are so many grievances put in against individuals, it basically masks what's a real grievance, and the grievance procedures need to be there particularly in, in post-apartheid South Africa, where we're dealing with all kinds of issues to do with race and power and, and breaking breaking old systems that are, are, are generations old. So there's that. but um, And then there's this issue of corruption. And, and then linked to that as well um, is the fact that we need to, going forward, the way that um, it, polygraph testing will eventually work is it will be very targeted, um, but nobody will ever be dismissed because of a polygraph test. So a polygraph test will only lead to an investigation. So if, if if issues are raised in the polygraph test, then that will lead to an investigation. And that will then either lead to disciplinary action and potentially criminal action or full exoneration, basically. And so we need to have clear functioning grievance processes that can work, because if we're going to go down that route and use polygraph testing to, to lead to investigations that can lead to disciplinary action, we don't need the water muddied by the criminal syndicates basically driving grievance processes. I don't think we can get around it, but um, but we need to try and tidy up that process. I hope that helps, Liz. Yes, I think uh, that answered the question. Thank you so much. Um, we have a very, very limited amount of time left. Um, I am hoping perhaps there's someone from the audience uh, who would like to pose a final question. Um, to any of the speakers. Um, But at the same time, uh, I would also like to kind of invite the speakers, any final comments uh, regarding the discussion uh, that we had now? We've had limited time, of course, um, to discuss everything, but uh, please, if there's uh, some final comments. uh... May may I just say a couple of, uh, maybe a final comment uh, from us is the, the importance of the, of the energy uh, of civic uh, civic missions, right? And the importance of enthusiasm and, and energy and continuous work because people get very often tired. And what we see from the trust, right? The more trust people have to the authorities, recent studies in Ukraine show that people trust anti-corruption agencies to do the good job, even when they don't know what the anti-corruption agency is doing, right? So there is this, um, there is this element that, uh, yes, civic, civic engagement matters and it matters when there is a certain degree isn't it continuous sort of um, work in the system and engagement in the system absolutely well thank you for that i think that's a that's a a really good final concluding thought for very many of the presentations that we heard here um today um i would like to thank all the panel members once again for their presentations um really really insightful um and interesting both the subject, but also just the spread and the context of each, but still it's the same questions that we return to. So that's a a wonderful arch. Thank you so much. Um, And I hope that everyone enjoys the rest of the